it looks like we're live now. It looks like everybody is here in our Zoom meeting, so that's exciting. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us today. I am Dr. Becky Bowling. I am an Extension Urban Water Specialist here at the Dallas Center. Um, today on Chat with Green Aggies, we are doing something a little different, which I'm actually excited about. We've prepared a, a uh, is your landscape ready for summer checklist? And so we're going to rotate through some different things that uh, professionals, green industry professionals and enthusiasts alike should be thinking about as we move into some of the hottest months of the year. And we are going to kind of take turns speaking today, each talking about different topics. So um, kind of a different format than we might normally have, um, probably some good chit chat along the way as well. Um, I wanted to get started today uh, just with some introductions. So uh, Chrissy, you're first on my screen. You want to go first? Sure. Um, I am Chrissy Siggers. I am the Extension Turf Grass Specialist located at the Dallas Center. Erfan? Hi, Erfan, Extension Program Specialist through the Department of Entomology uh, based out of Overton, Texas in East Texas. Kevin? Hey, I'm uh, a plant pathologist uh, affiliated with the Department of Plant Pathology and Microbiology uh, based here in College Station. Mang Mang? Hi, uh, uh, Dr. Mang Mang Gu, uh, Professor Extension Specialist in the Horticulture Science Department here in College Station. Paul. Uh, Paul Winsky, I am the County Extension Agent for Horticulture in Harris County. And normally we would have our good friend, Laura Miller with us, who is the uh, commercial horticulture agent in Tarrant County. Unfortunately, she had um, some family things come up today, so she's unable to join us. Um, but uh, hopefully by next week, she'll be back. Um, so Paul is actually gonna kick us off this week. So um, this is, I'm gonna let him go ahead and get started. And uh, like I said, we're gonna rotate through. So take it away, Paul. Okay, so the first thing we're going to touch on are summer safety tips, uh, especially if you're a landscaper or a greenhouse worker. Um, you know, you might have interns coming in now, you might have some uh, high school students coming in, uh, which could be an issue. Uh, so just be aware and hopefully on a regular basis, you are working with uh, uh, your teams with regard to heat safety. So. Um, you know, becoming overheated, there's two factors, uh, you know, the internal heat that you generate doing the labor, uh, and we know working in a nursery or in a greenhouse can be uh, physically challenging. Uh, and then, of course, our external heat, our environment is starting to warm up. Uh, so these are our two biggest issues. So the main thing uh, we, you want to drive, you know, across to everybody is making sure, A, that they're drinking uh, at least every 15 minutes. And, and even if you're, you know, not thirsty, uh, we used to every morning when I was on the nursery side, um, we had team meetings, uh, before we got started. And, and this time of year, we always, uh, you know, hammered that home to make sure that they were drinking, um, because it, it does take its toll on you, uh, taking breaks, uh, in the shade or in air conditioning. So if you're, you know, driving from spot to spot, mowing lawns or doing jobs, you know, running that AC uh, and, and, and just being smart about it, really. I know uh, the work's got to get done, um, but the breaks are, are necessary in order for uh, everybody to be safe. Um, the type of clothing is, is, is key also. Um, when I was in high school wearing, uh, working for the landscaper, uh, it was a t-shirt and shorts and now things have de definitely changed. And you can see a lot of the crews, they've got the lightweight, long sleeve uh, material, they've got the hats on, they've got everything uh, to cover up. And it actually does work much better uh, keeping yourself cooler because you're keeping that, uh, those sun rays off of you. Uh, and the other thing is, is really learning those signs of heat uh, illness. Um, we had an intern one year that um, uh, didn't pay attention to that, uh, you know, dehydration, heat exhaustion, and then uh, leading to heat stroke. So, you know, if, if that person, that worker becomes nauseous or dizzy, uh, you know, there, there's, there's something uh, occurring there. They get lightheaded, they get fatigued, um, clammy skin. So these are the things that you've got to be aware of uh, when you're working in the heat. And if you've got those new workers, it's going to take some acclimation, you know, a week or so or two to get them used to uh, working in that heat. Um, 
But don't forget about driving safety. Uh, this is the busy time of the season. So there's more work, more driving time between sites. So, uh, you know, make sure that the uh, workers are aware of that, that your drivers are aware of that. And then your other safety basics don't go out the window, um, even though we're focusing on heat safety. Uh, so don't be, you know, don't forget about the eye protection and uh, protective footwear and gloves and, and hearing protection if they're running the mowers for a long period of time. So, um, you know, just be smart and, um, you know, be aware of uh, the conditions that uh, everybody's gonna be working in. Paul, you bring up a really good point. You know, I remember uh, when I'm working in, in the heat of the greenhouses, I had to do quite a bit of um, counting of insects within cages within greenhouses and it get really hot. And being the Canadian polar bear that I am, you know, I had like <laughs> one of those like microfiber headbands that I would soak in ice water first. And then I had an ice vest as well that has like <laughs> ice packs lined on the inside. It would last like two hours. Every couple hours, I'd go back to the freezer and refresh my, my ice cube uh, vest. <laughs> it was pretty funny. But uh, yeah, that's, those are all good tips that I could have used earlier. Okay, um, and then I'm up again here. So what I'm just gonna touch on is, is sort of five annuals uh, that I really like for the heat. Uh, the first one on the uh, left are pentas. Uh, again, summer bloomers, um, various varieties or series out there, great colors um, and, and lots of different uh, growth habits. Uh, so we've got short varieties that'll top out at about six to eight inches. And we've got varieties that you can use as cut flowers. Uh, definitely bring in the beneficial insects. They bring in, you know, the uh, butterflies. Um, so I, I, I just really enjoy seeing pentas in the landscape, especially in the heat of the summer. Portulaca is another one. I, I, I think we don't see enough of it. Uh, it's a great ground cover. It's got that uh, succulent type foliage. Uh, some of the problems I, I see with it is in the presentation at retail where the garden centers have it in the shade. Uh, and one of the problems is, is if it's in the shade, those flowers don't open. So the good garden centers have it out in the sun. So when you walk in, um, that flower power just hits you. Um, they are only open during the day. They're open for one day. But uh, the image in the middle, that's a single flower, but there's doubles out there. Uh, so there, there's some really strong flower production and, and real good drought tolerance once they're established. Uh, the other one I like on the right are vincas. Uh, they do extremely well. There's been a lot of very good breeding on it. Um, personally, I, I like the coras. I've never had any issues with them. Now there's the Cora XDRs which is extra disease resistant. So it's got more um, resistance to aerial Phytophthora, different races. So um, we are gonna get some of them this year in our trials down here to see how well they do perform. Uh, but I just like the overall growth habit uh, and, and the overall flower production uh, for Vinca, especially in the uh, full sun. Uh, next slide, please. I should have two more images. Yes, Angelonia. Another one, the summer sun, uh, summer sun uh, snapdragon, I'm sorry. Um, these great spikes that are held well above the plant. Um, again, dwarf varieties, about 10 inches, and then taller varieties. Um, there are some, there's a series out there that has a larger flower to it, but these will just thrive in the heat of the summer. And then last but not least, one that's uh, probably overlooked um, is Gumfrina. Uh, several series out there. We did a trial a couple years back and we looked at the ping pongs, which did extremely well. That flower has that, um, you know, sort of that straw feel to it. It's very dry, uh, but they thrive uh, uh, in our heat. And I think they work best in the landscape when you sort of have them interspersed throughout and they just sort of pop up amongst the other um, annuals and perennials that you might have in that bed. Um, it's, it's not maybe a plant that's made for, for doing, in, you know, in mass or in waves. I, I think it does better as it sort of pops up throughout. Um, that's the typical uh, flower color, but there's whites, there's pinks, uh, you know, that magenta, the purples and things like that. So that, that is my top five uh, annuals for the, uh, the heat of the summer. Hey, Paul, this is Meng Meng. I have a question for you. Sure. 
Uh, this is a quiz, so just be uh, prepared. Uh, okay, I didn't I mean, study last I put, night. I'm, I'm putting on my professor hat here. So <laughs> what's the difference between the Portulaca and Purse Lane? And do you know the scientific name of each? Oh, geez. Uh, well, por well, Portulaca. Airphone, can we go the, back one slide? Portulaca is the genus. Um, Purse Lane. Uh, Honestly, I don't. I thought Port Purslane was also Portulaca on the same on the genus. Yes, um, you're right. Okay. There are two okay. different. There are right. two different, different species, species um, but the same genus. Okay. Yes, Becky. Yeah, Becky is uh, is rescuing you in the chat. Um, oh, um, I, I don't have it open, so I'm not seeing it. So. Okay. Um, I, I know. I know the weed name. <laughs> <laughs> Port Portulaca oleracea is the common purslane. Yes, that's a, that's a, that's a common purslane, uh, and then portulaca, and of course portulaca is is the genus name, and then the common name uh, portulaca uh, normally refers to portulaca grandiflora. Right. Uh, okay. So the the uh, portulaca grandiflora that has more a cylinder cylinder leaf versus purslane has this uh, flat teardrop or ovate shaped leaf. So, so what you, uh, the picture shows here uh, looks more, more a, uh, um, you know, a, a purslane uh, versus portulaca, but you are correct that both mm -hmm. uh, are in the uh, portulaca genus. Okay, hopefully yeah. I- Thank you, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll wait for my gold star to come in the mail. <laughs> Well, this is a uh, this is this is a uh, uh, this is my slide. Uh, thank you, Erfang. Uh, it seems like one picture is missing, uh, but that uh, that's uh, oh, all right. Great, great, great. Is that it? Yes, yes. Okay. That was the picture that I was. Uh, that that's the picture that I was looking for. Um, so uh, so my. my I want to go through some of the, the plants that we've seen in the landscape. I want to talk a little bit about uh, just a little bit about pruning and uh, and, you know, and dealing with the, the you know, the freeze uh, that we had over three months ago. Um, so this is a this is a Texas sage. This is a Texas sage that uh, um, that was obviously had a lot of damage, as you can see from the picture on the left. Uh, Generally, Texas sage is uh, is a very good kind of you know not as tied as uh, some uh, shrub hollies you know as in the meatball shape, but they're pretty uh, they're pretty good you know when the sheared you know they grow into that meatball sh uh, shape. And this one you know after the freeze, obviously uh, you can't you know those those dead twigs won't come back. So. This is what it looks like when all the dead twigs, uh, all the unsightly dead twigs are uh, pruned off. The nice thing about uh, uh, set, uh, you know, Texas sedge uh, with so many other plants, uh, they are a group of uh, plants called uh, remontants. Um, uh, I have a quiz for all of you here. What does a remontant mean? Reblooming. Yes, yes, keep Re blooming. Two, yes, two gold um, stars. Um, I'll be waiting for them. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said at the same time as Paul. Yes, you did. You did, Erfong. That's uh, very impressive as an uh, uh, entomologist. So, yes. Uh, thank you. So, so, um, um, so, you know, for this particular one, uh, cut off the uh, dead uh, branches. Uh, you know, they're not going to come back. Um, so, uh, and, and, you know, after all the rain that we have been having, uh, definitely you'll see the uh, buds uh, forming on these uh, Texas sages. Um, all right, next. Um, Meng Meng, I just wanted to comment here real quick um, yes. and make sure everybody knows that meatball shape is a technical term, right? <laughs> we use it in our scientific writing when we, when we do uh, <laughs> I, uh, I know that I have been using meatball a lot. Yes, yes, meatball, <laughs> meatball shape. If you look uh, through uh, many formal uh, style uh, landscapes, you'll definitely know what meatball, you know, what, what kind of meatball I'm talking about, what kind of meatball I'm talking about. Um, this has been a year 
that's uh, like, just, it, well, so far I can't, I can't, I can't say, you know, from this point forward, but, but so far after the freeze, I think if, if anything, if any plant in our landscape benefited, you know, benefited from the freeze, I think uh, it was probably the roses. I don't know whether you all agree with me. Uh, we have seen uh, one of our county agents uh, actually called me one day that we, we, we talked for half an hour discussing, wow, why are these roses just look so great this year? I mean, they just look so great this year. If you think about it, roses are, uh, you know, they're not uh, um, afraid of uh, uh, freezing the cold temperatures. Uh, in the, as a matter of fact, uh, the, the thing that bothers roses here is more uh, a high temperature than cold temperature. So the roses, uh, pretty much there were not a whole lot of damage from the uh, winter storm that we had. But that winter storm actually did them some uh, good that uh, they get to, you know, finally get to take a break. They get to shed their uh, leaves, go dormant a little bit, uh, have a good night or several good nights sleep. And then they came back just so uh, vibrantly. And that's what we have been seeing. And then the... Um, the, uh, the, the rain that we have uh, been having. Of course, uh, uh, Dr. Ong may have, some, may have seen a lot of the foliar disease issue like uh, black spot and that kind of thing. But in general, in general, um, you know, if, if you ask me about pruning roses at this point, I would say, you know, just leave them alone. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, the, uh, on the, the right side, that's a picture of the uh, wax myrtle. The wax myrtle has been hit, and you'll probably know, uh, like really bad, first by the first ice storm, and then later on by the second snow, and then snow turned into ice, snow turned into ice, um, and um, you know, just a lot of damage on the uh, uh, wax myrtles. And um, a lot of, well, uh, similar to the uh, Texas sage that we showed in the previous uh, slides, it, there, there's uh, for all those dead branches. There's no use. There's no use of uh, uh, keeping them. Um, either uh, cut them back, and they kind of generate into this uh, poodle, uh, poodle shape. Uh, almost, you know, this is almost uh, uh, as bad a, uh, a, a cutting or pruning as a, a you know crepe murder that we have seen commonly on crepe myrtles. Um, but you know, if this is a shape that the homeowners would prefer, this could be done. But otherwise, uh, maybe just take the whole thing uh, if this photo shape is not prepared, uh, is not preferred. Next, please. Um, <clears throat> so this is uh, we. I mean, again, you know, for for plants like cream myrtles, we often say, you know, don't do topping, don't murder. Uh, don't do this. Just, just you know, uh, take off the uh, dead branches, uh, the, the disease branches, uh, or thin in, you know, to make the structurally safe and, and stuff like that. So this is an example that this is, uh, you know, is a live example why, you know, topping, unselective, uh, unselective topping is not good for a crane myrtle. So there are uh, there's a row of uh, Muskogee on um, between on, on Rock Prairie here in College Station. It's right. So this row of crane myrtle is right between the Prairie Elementary School and the College Station Middle School. And as you uh, can, you all see my uh, mouse. Nope. Okay. You can see I'm my mouse. Have to annotate. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so tell us about this bird right here. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Airphone. Yes. Okay. All right. So. You probably see this area and in this area. So you notice that there is the, you know, this power line. And because of this power line here, uh, I think it was probably the city. The city had to do some pruning and they, you know, just literally they just topped, they just topped this area. And what you see is that uh, the, the topped area uh, compared to this area that's not being topped, 
you know, they uh, the flowering totally. You see, you'll see the the flowering difference um, uh, for the top area uh, that they have to accumulate. They have to accumulate certain level of growth for this year. And crane myrtles do flower on the current year growth. And you know, there is a delay. There surely there's a delay in flowering. And if you'll remember, last year I I did a presentation on. Uh, you know, the flowering and the reflower, reblooming of cray myrtles. So, you know, the delay in flowering in the first flush of flowering will definitely affect, you know, whether there, there, there will be a second flush or, you know, whether the second flush will be significant enough. So it's um, just remember top end delays, uh, delays flowering on cray myrtles and possibly on many other, on many other, um, current year growth, uh, current year flowering plants, like for instance, Texas lilac, um, vitex. Um, next, please. <clears throat> so a lot of plants in the horticulture, you know, uh, in, in the ornamental, in the landscape horticulture industry are, are identical. They're clones, uh, often that they are from that one uh, cutting and just start to multiply, you know, they just cut those root, they grow and they will cut uh, cuttings from that plant and they will grow into thousands, into millions. So, you know, what you see, um, if, if that plant got the same name, let's say uh, cray myrtle, uh, a Natchez cray myrtle, you know, they're basically identical, they're, they're, they're clones. Um, this is, um, the the winter storm kind of revealed to us oh there are some of the plants there are some of the plants in the uh, in the landscapes are not clones they're like these um, uh, sago palms that they're not clones they're uh, not they're not triplets uh, they're actually you know uh, have uh, different uh, genetic background and and that's probably why so they what I'm saying is that they're not cut and propagated. They're not clonally uh, propagated. They're not vegetative uh, propagated. They're probably seed. They're from seeds, and that's probably why that you see the difference among these three sago palms. You know, one <clears throat> totally, uh, one totally uh, got over the cold early, uh, early enough. You know, already flushing with the top and also some of the uh, bottom pups. Uh, this one. Uh, very likely dead, uh, and this one right in between. And of course, do we know whether this one is 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 um, is is really really dead? And we have been uh, telling folks, you know, almost we almost sound like uh, uh, you know broken record again again. You know, just wait and wait and wait. Um, it uh, the waiting, uh, you know, definitely uh, pays off. Um, Arafon, would you go to the next one? Yes. Um, so this is this is this is where uh, this is where you know the this has been definitely over three months uh, after the winter storm uh, on the palms. So you know this Phoenix palm is definitely coming back a lot faster than this Washingtonia and also this one. But gradually, gradually, that you see. Uh, these coming backs, you know, gradually you see these coming backs, you know, just, just, there is just a little, just a little uh, green things here, you know, just a little green things here, um, you know, that I think it was smart for, uh, for this landscaper to wait until that there is this uh, green thing here uh, to, to make sure, oh, this is alive. And that's when, you know, the, the landscaper chose to, um, Cut off all the the dead uh, the dead leaves because uh, otherwise you know if you think about it you gotta climb up there to clean uh, to cut all those uh, dead leaves otherwise if there's no green there's no green here it would be just much easier just cut it oh sorry it would be much easier just to you know cut it from the bottom if uh, we know for sure uh, this is dead so for the palms uh, in this area I would say let's give them uh, more time. Um, maybe waiting is the uh, best thing that we can do. 
Next, please. Oop, I had a quick question back here. What's going on over here, Mung Mung? Oh, is this like epicormic uh -huh. branching kind of going on here? What is that? No. Uh, so these are uh, these these are little these are little pubs. These are little pubs. So what? Oh. <clears throat> um, um, generally, generally we we don't view sago palm as 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 we have see other plants. You know, we just see that we just see that they have this one thing. But but the thing is, they actually have like dormant bud here, here, you know, so they do have dormant buds at the bottom or sometimes here in the middle. So they do have certain dormant buds. So that winter storm definitely, you know, hurt the winter storm hurt the top, uh, you know, it hurt the top. So so it and that 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 the damage to the top, of course, it didn't kill the top. But the damage to the top stimulated the growth of these side. They're not branches, you know. They're not really branches, but they are, you know, uh, stimulate these uh, these dormant buds from growing. So, um, so yeah. So these are these okay. are basically each individual uh, kind of branching Little out. Puppies. So should they be like? Should they be ideally removed? <clears throat> Depends. Uh, some people like multi trunk, but I would say in this case, uh, I would remove them all to keep the uniform single uh, single trunk, um, single palm. They're but not mama, puppies, you... Chrissy. They're not puppies. They're pups. Oh, they're that's not what puppies. Said. Well, that's very disappointing. I thought they were puppies. Yeah. yeah. Mang Mang, could you pot them up the way that you would with some of the other succulents and turn them into new plants? Propagate them? Yes, yes. Um, so, you know, for like, for uh, little agaves, uh, for a lot of succulents, you know, uh, for a lot of succulents of this russet looking succulents, they often come with a, uh, a mini, uh, you know, a mini something, uh, you know, they're, they're little minis. Um, they look almost exactly just like the the mother plant, but in but just smaller in size. So we call all those pubs. <laughs> and I think the first person who came up with the name is probably a dog loving person. <laughs> Sounds about right. Uh, I think this is a repeat, and we're on to this one, right? Okay. Yeah. So this is irrigation checkup. Yeah, that's me. That's mean. So Mung Mung, are you saying that maybe had the person that came up with that been more of a cat person, they would be called kittens? That's They're very kittens. possible. That's very possible. It's, yes, exactly. Um, so I wanted to kind of have a reminder, of course, you know, we're limited on time. So there's only so much detail I'm going to go into on some of this today, but we can revisit some of this in future talks. We've talked about some of these things before. And uh, this month in June, Dr. Chase Straw is going to be joining us um, to talk about advancement in turf irrigation. So he'll talk about some new technologies and, and uh, new methodologies that can be employed to optimize irrigation. So that'll be the second week of June. So if you're really interested in, in an irrigation topic, that'd be a good week to to join us. Um, but I wanted to kind of have a reminder that we've had a lot of rain. A lot of us have been able to kind of avoid the irrigation uh, aspect of management so far this year. That's probably going to change within the next month. Um, you know, typically once we get past May, we'll start to dry out some and then we'll stay dry for the rest of the summer. And so we will end up relying quite a bit on supplemental irrigation to maintain many parts of our landscape. So it is good to make sure that everything is running smoothly. Hopefully you've already been out and audited this year. Um, you know, we had some recommendations, especially following the winter storm that auditing earlier in the year, getting a sense of potential damage that may have incurred as a function of that storm was gonna be kind of a good way to go. Um, but if not, you know, it's not too late, uh, but you definitely wanna get out there and think about some of these things before you really need your irrigation. So 
first thing is taking time to audit or have an audit professionally performed uh, by a TCEQ licensed irrigator. We've talked on this program before that uh, nobody should be uh, exchanging irrigation repairs, auditing, any kind of service in exchange for fees or anything like that uh, in the state of Texas without an irrigator's license from the TCEQ. So, um, you know, whether you have somebody on your staff that's licensed, you yourself are licensed, uh, or you're joining us and you're a homeowner or a master or gardener, um, don't pay anybody to come work on your system unless you know that they're a licensed irrigator. Um, so taking time to audit allows us to uh, not only assess for repairs and needed updates, uh, but it also allows us to uh, learn the precipitation rate for our system if we don't, and it's good to check in with us on a regular basis, at least annually, so that you know exactly how much water you're putting out each time you irrigate. Um, this allows us, especially for our lawn areas, to follow evapotranspiration-based irrigation recommendations, which often kind times come in the form of inches of water per week. If we have no idea, you know, a lot of times, and I've talked about this probably on here before and definitely in other programs, I ask people, well, how much do you water? How much do you irrigate? And they'll say, oh, twice, three times a week for an hour. We have no idea maybe what that actually equates to in terms of how much water we're putting out. So in order to really be efficient with our irrigation, we want to know the precipitation rate for our system. Which, whether we're learning that on our own through a catch can audit at home or we're having a professional come in and look at that for us. Um, formal professional audit will also allow us to really get a good sense of uh, system efficiency as well, uniformity of application. Do we have an issue where more water is being applied to a certain area than another and do we need to make some adjustments uh, to our system to address this? So uh, making sure that we've got all of that kind of ready to go. Uh, next thing is, kind of having a plan in place for how you're going to calculate irrigation need uh, based on where you are in the state of Texas, based on what you're irrigating. Um, you know, this may mean doing something as simple as signing up for the Water My Yard program that uh, biological and ag engineering do through Texas and m AgriLife Extension. Um, it's not available everywhere in Texas, but it is available in many areas, especially around some of our big urban hubs. And so uh, this allows you to receive an email or a text message once a week telling you exactly how much water to put out in inches per week. So you need to know that again. Um, you know, and, and if you aren't going to take that approach or you don't have that at your disposal, um, there you can visit the uh, Texas ET network. And I'm going to hope that Chrissy maybe can put the link in the chat while I'm talking because I'm sure she'll have it in her back pocket just like I do. But um, visit the Texas ET network, learn a little bit about where the weather stations are here in the state of Texas. This is a map of our weather stations on that network. And you'll find some good information on how to do some of those calculations. And it doesn't mean you have to do it every week. Uh, but you can do take some historic data, get a sense of how much water you're going to need to put out in your area. Most of the time here in Texas, uh, for established turf grass lawns, which, which tend to require more water, for example, than uh, perennial landscape beds, um, we don't need to apply more than half an inch to one inch of water per week to really be able to maintain those areas. It's less than a lot of people think. Um, and so even if you just want to take that number, uh, maybe start with half an inch per week and start there and kind of see how your lawn responds to that. And, uh, you know, and the other thing is that um, we can always water based on visible wilt. My husband and I never turn on our automated irrigation in the summertime. And so while it may make sense, depending on, you know, the, the facility that you're maintaining or whatever, to have some kind of automation in other scenarios, it may, it may be better to not automate your irrigation. Um, it's also good to think about this. So we do have some professional landscapers that join this program. And the interesting thing here is that this is one of those practices that often you may not have control over, but can significantly affect the work that you do in the landscapes that you manage. So having a good pathway of communication, even some materials that you can share with clients um, to help guide what they're doing with their irrigation system, um, giving that to them this time of year can be really helpful um, because if they're over or under watering, it can really start to make some, some things difficult for you as the professional that may be handling other things in that landscape. Um, and then finally, kind of along all of this, along the same lines as all of this is having a plan for scheduling, uh, making sure that you're taking a very intentional approach to programming the system to run at the appropriate time, which is typically going to be early morning. 
um, and making sure that you've got it at the appropriate frequency for the material that you're trying to maintain. So for turf grass lawns, uh, for example, we don't need to water more than one to two times per week. Typically it's again, less than people tend to think. Um, and I typically recommend, I don't know what Christy's suggestion is, but I, I typically feel that you don't need to have automated irrigation more than about four months of the year here, um, which are typically gonna be June, July, August, and maybe September. This month, as you've seen, we've gotten a lot of rainfall. So, you know, if we needed to turn the system on one week, we could do that manually. Um, but most of the time, just those really hot months where we have a lot of active growth is the only time we might automate, especially because we don't receive as much rainfall. The rest of the year, that should be turned off and only turned on as needed. So again, really uh, either thinking about that for our own businesses and operations and or trying to convey that to clients to help us both conserve water and make sure that they're not doing things that could be damaging uh, in the landscape. Christy, what do you typically tell people about automation and scheduling? Yeah, I typically, if, if they are not able to sign up for one of those programs and they don't have one of those fancy uh, irrigation systems, right? Um, typically, basically the same thing you say, you know, there's no need for automatic irrigation to be on right now. Tell that to our HOA, but, um, you know, there's no need for that to be on um, until it starts starts to uh, dry up a little bit. And then um, you can kind of watch it, of course, you know, but I, I generally recommend not to just set it and forget it for sure. Yep. Yep. Making sure if you do have an automated program, making sure that you have a plan for getting it turned off when we do get rainfall like this. My next door neighbor this week had their irrigation on in the evening while it was still raining outside because they weren't paying attention to it. That is just the most the frustrating atrocities. thing. The atrocities. What a bad neighbor. Oh, man. I know. Wow. I know. <laughs> I'm going to have to move. <laughs> Betsy, but, Betsy, if, if, um, if, if, if the irrigation controller has, is, is what do you call it, is a smart controller that the factor in the uh, precipitation, um, can you put it on, uh, you know, autopilot mode? That's a great question, Meng Meng. So what I would say is, um, yes, with an asterisk. So it's really important, even though we have a lot of great advancements in technology, and this can significantly help us to be more efficient, we do see that sometimes things do not go the way that they should. This is true with any technology that we have in our life, right? So still providing, having some plan in place to provide oversight, don't exclusively trust everything. Make sure that you're still in tune with what's going on, making sure that things are working properly. Have a plan in place for monitoring, checking in with those things on a regular basis. Um, because I, again, I just, I think um, even in studies where we have smart controllers, et cetera, I think we still see a lot of times that if you really want to conserve water and you really want to be as efficient with water as you can, doing things manually based on visual, visible wilt is the way to go. It really allows us to keep from overwatering, but I know a lot of us are really busy and that may be a little harder to employ. Um, so smart controllers are great, but again, still making sure we have some oversight there for sure. Um, what about, I up. have this thing so smart that uh, it has the sensor built in into it. So when it's, so when the sensor tells me, oh, it's dry. And then, you know, well, it tells the controller, then the controller is gonna kick on. So what about so, that kind of smart? Control. So here's my here's my um, follow up question. Where is the sensor in your landscape, and do you feel that it represents all parts of your landscape? That's a great question, Dr. Becky Ballin. Uh, <laughs> so, so what about again, I have multiple I have multiple sensors, <laughs> and each sensor control a zone on this controller. Uh, well, it sounds like you figured it out, Mong Mong. I don't know. I I so again. You know, we see like what if the limitations sometimes with uh, irrigation systems that um, utilize soil moisture sensors, again, they can be great. They can give us an edge and allow us to have more information on what's going on in our landscape. But depending on where those are placed, how well they're placed, they may not do a, a great job of capturing what's happening across the landscape. You know, and so, and that also speaks to thinking about where those sensors go in, doing your research on how to use that equipment the best possible way. So again, a lot of things that can kind of play into that. I still think oversight, staying engaged with what's happening is really important. I agree, thank you. Okay, 
Reminder to do soil testing. We talk about soil testing all the time on here, so I'm not going to do huge amounts of time on this, but if you've not conducted a soil test already this year, this can be a good time to do it if we have a couple of days that, that dry out because the soil will be a little bit softer and easier to get to that target depth of about six inches in our turf grass areas. Um, you know, if you're going to collect samples, you can, you might collect a separate sample for turf grass areas and a different sample for landscape beds and a different sample for vegetable beds. Um, all of these areas may have very different soil properties, just as a function of what's been there and how they've been managed. And they also may have very different nutrient and pH needs. And so having those areas looked at separately would be good. Um, if you're a professional, increasingly, I think if you can really customize your nutrient management approach to what is actually warranted by the, uh, from the soil test, um, that's, that's the way to go. So um, soil tests, regular basis. Um, to really look at all of these different things, uh, soil pH, nutrient availability, uh, and even conductivity in our soils is important. I just want to say you and your husband have done a great job in y'all's landscape. I mean, this looks yeah, really pretty. Yeah, it looks great. Don't actually I mean, I don't know. My I'm assuming this is where you did the soil sample test, but if you didn't, you might want to check for gophers. <laughs> That's where we've accumulated. So in another, in another version of this, I had trouble with the Google, but the, the little uh, soil sampling probe moves all around the yard and then ends up next to the soil pile to show. Incredible. That's... Incredible. <laughs> okay. So last little thing I wanted to talk about is water quality testing. Paul did a talk talking about water testing uh, last week, right? I think it was last week. So you can go back and watch that talk as well. I think it was very uh, catered to the greenhouse and nursery side of things. I tend to think about it more in terms of the open landscape side of things, but a lot of overlap in terms of what's important. Um, so these are, to me, the four biggest parameters that we want to look at when we're looking at water quality. Um, again, I'm not going to go into them in a whole lot of detail today, but I wanted to get them in here um, to kind of show... Um, how many different things, how complex this can be. Um, sometimes with water testing, we just don't quite know what we're supposed to be looking for and, it, and we don't quite realize how many things are interrelated. So a great example of this is in the case of sodium. The impact of sodium and the damage that it can do on our soil and plant materials is very uh, dependent on several other things that may be going on in that water, including the amount of calcium, magnesium, and bicarbonates. So if we only have the sodium piece and we don't have those other pieces, we don't have the whole picture. And so when we're thinking about water quality, if we have concerns about water quality, which often comes up if we have a well, retention pond, or we're using recycled water in some capacity, this is going to be really important that we do a water test and we understand what is the salinity hazard or the potential damage that salts can do. What is the sodium hazard? And again, the risk of sodium uh, and the amount of sodium relative to some of these other things. Um, what is the role that bicarbonates or carbonates might play? And um, are there any other uh, potential elements, excessive concentration of things that may be toxic? Boron is one that commonly comes to mind for me. And um, we have certain landscape plants that can be very sensitive to boron. Um, you know, and this doesn't necessarily just apply to uh, alternative water sources either, as my dear friend Meng Meng uh, knows very well, the water quality in College Station, not great, definitely can create some challenges, even the potable water. So um, good to think about all of this and also good to remember that this not only affects your plants, it can affect your soil. It can degrade the soil structure over time and it can create issues with rooting and permeability and a lot of other problems. So important to, to keep this in the back of your mind. Next slide. And then this is just the actual parameters that might show up on your water test. So again, you know, I, I've started talking about this more and more as I've gotten water tests from uh, professionals where they send me, they've paid, they've taken the time to collect the sample, send it to a lab, get me the analysis and it will just literally just have sodium on it because they just didn't know. They didn't know all of these different things that we need to know and how complicated it is. And so um, I like to share, you know, the, there's several different things we want to make sure on that test, several different things that we want to look at. And so this is kind of an overview of what some of those things are. So I just wanted to share that. Okay, it's my turn. Um, so I uh, know we don't have much time, so I'm gonna try to be rather quick with the update. So we're gonna move over to a straight uh, turf grass pest update. 
So these are just some common insects slash arachnids, right? Because mites aren't actually insects, right, Erfan? Woo! All right, don't be too hasty with that. That was me trying to unmute myself, sorry. <laughs> um, so these are some of the common insects I get questions about as we move in from kind of the cooler months into the summer. So uh, something that's already been pretty prevalent this year, especially with residential yards even, are mites. And so there are three basic types of mites we deal with. There are Bermuda grass mites, there are zoysia grass mites, and there are buffalo grass mites. In this photo here, um, this is an example of a zoysia grass plant that had a mite issue um, last year. And so this is one of the, the best photos I could find from an actual homeowner that sent me one. And so common symptomology of mite infections on grass are what's called a witch's broom. <laughs> and so it kind of looks like a tiny little broom, right? And so uh, if you start seeing some symptoms like that in your yard, uh, you can um, at least, you know, say, hey, maybe I have a mite problem. Um, next, uh, click over for the next photo. So mites are very, very tiny. You cannot see them with your naked eye. Um, you'll have to use a microscope. I think there's something like 0.21 millimeters in length. So very, very small, right? Um, so this is under a microscope. This is, and click one more time, Airfun. There you go, <laughs> it's circled there. So uh, mites, we are limited when we start talking about um, controlling them in turf grass, they like to uh, hide down in the sheaths of the turf grass. And so it's very tough to get a miticide or an insecticide down in there. So based on some research that I have seen uh, through the years and updates that I've watched recently about controlling mites in turf grass, really uh, we only have a couple options. So um, there is an active ingredient called abamectin, and unfortunately, it's not labeled for residentials, residential sites. And so, um, you know, if you're at a commercial site, if you're at a golf course, you're at a sports field, then that might be something that you can use. We have seen good results in infested sites around Dallas. Um, I've worked with a golf course superintendent and a sports field manager to control mites. And basically what we did is, is Bermuda grass mites. We heavily verticutted or heavily scalped, and then we treated it with abamectin. Also, we did abamectin in a tank mix of bifenthrin, which is really labeled more for suppression. Um, but, you know, I've had a homeowner recently who had a very, very bad mite infestation with Bermuda grass, and we we verticut, we scalped, we used bifenthrin twice, and actually the grass is recovering quite well. Um, although witches' brooms are, are pretty much taken up whenever we verticut and remove that material. So that's very important as well, right? If you do have mites in your yard and you don't want to spray an insecticide or a miticide, then you could control them culturally by, by um, mowing your grass low, collecting those clippings, and getting rid of that material to try to move those mites off site. Okay, uh, that's all for mites. You, you got the chinch bugs uh, below it too, I'm gonna... Yeah, but there's another photo. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Um, sorry, I kind of had mine set up as like a whoo, transition kind of thing. It's kind of hard gotcha. when they're doing those slides. Um, so sorry about that. Um, so uh, something that will start popping up soon ish if it ever stops raining right and it actually gets warm outside um are chinch bugs you know chinch bugs primarily will prefer saint augustine grass but sometimes we do see them feed on some of our other warm season grasses just not as common as uh, saint augustine grass and so chinch bugs really prefer the more dry hot time of the year we typically don't see them until you know later in the summer it's very hot outside um, they can mimic drought issues, as you can see here in this photo. Um, uh, next photo. There's one more photo. There you go. There they are. And so, um, you know, chinch bugs are very small as well, uh, but you can scout for them. You can actually see them. Um, the ones that are the life cycle that is actually hurting the grass are the nymph 
stage. We think that they are basically uh, piercing the grass, removing some of the liquid, and basically maybe shooting some toxic material back in there. I don't know if we've ever confirmed that is actually the way that they uh, actually kill the grass, but it's something that they're thinking of. And so um, these two guys here on the end are the adults. And so really there's no true preventative insecticide for chinch bugs. So you kind of have to do some scouting. Hey, I had these last year. I'm noticing some drought symptoms on my yard that aren't getting better with water. Um, you know, maybe we can, we can hit it then. So some of the primary control options are any insecticide that contains carbaryl or any of the pyrethroid insecticides. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. Okay, uh, white grubs, you can go ahead and click the, I think there's two photos. One more. All right, woo. Okay, so uh, white grubs are something that is, is coming up rather soon and depending on what part of the state you're in, you know, we kind of have um, a few different recommendations for preventative control options, depending on if you're in Southern Texas, Central Texas, North Texas, but white grubs can attack any turf grass. Uh, really what they're attacking is the roots, right? And so, you know, we have what's called an economic threshold. Say, hey, if you've got this many grubs, five to 10 grubs per square foot, then it's going to um, be economically feasible for you to, to, to go ahead and treat. And so um, once we reach that threshold, we need to treat. And so um, this is a great time to mention that we see grubs, not to be confused with uh, Dr. Becky Grubbs bowling, right? She loves that. So I had to throw that in there. Um, so that eye roll went to the back of her head. <laughs> you got to throw some stuff like that in there. Um, so anyway, you know, there are- Do we? Do we? We do. There's census. Yes, we do. Yes. So we'll see grubs all throughout the year, right? And there's only a couple of types of grubs that actually are going to harm the turf grass. And that are going, those are going to be the main, uh, the May Jude beetles. And um, I can't remember the other one. Help me out, Becky. May, June beetle, beetles. Other mass chafer. Other mass chafer. Good job. Thank you. Um, and so we really want to start treating those around the appropriate time. And so depending on if you know you've had grubs in the past, then we might recommend a um, preventative option. We don't recommend a preventative option just for a run-of-the-mill application unless you know you have had grubs in the past. And so you can kind of see with this little timeline here, hey, here's some preventative timing. Usually in the North Texas area, we time around the end of June, uh, July 4th. Uh, Dr. Merchant used to always tell everyone Independence Day was time to treat grubs preventatively in DFW. So, you know, grab your hot dog, I guess, and go treat your grubs. Um, so, you know, just depending on what stage you're in, you can, you can visit this, uh, fact sheet down here for more info on the bottom of the slide. And it's kind of got, you know, Hey, if you're in the preventative stage, if you're in the curative stage, which means you're seeing grubs, but you haven't seen any above the ground injury. And then if you're in the rescue stage, Hey, I see injury, which also can mimic drought. Um, I need to use this type of, of insecticide. And so it just depends on what stage you're in for white grubs. Um, all right, that's it for insects. Let's go on to diseases. I think I just want to quickly mention that this is the, the Japanese beetle, as, as Keith Hansen mentioned, which okay. is an invasive, probably not the one you're most commonly going to see, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think around the landscapes in, in Texas, but rather you see probably more the, uh, the, or is it the June beetle, uh, basically would be a lot, a lot more common. Is that right, Chrissy? Or? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think Japanese beetle hasn't really been found a whole lot in the, in Texas yet. Um, hasn't established but, really well, right? Yeah. Right. I mean, in, you know, Arkansas pretty bad. So uh, I think it's probably vegetation in the, in Texas, especially West Texas, are not sown, you know, to the Japanese beetle diet or something. Vegetation yeah. and I think the density of weapons that uh, Texas residents have as compared to uh, further north. So, yeah. They're scared to come here. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Christy and I both did a lot of schooling in various forms out in the East. And so out there, those are a much bigger issue 
Yes. Um, mm -hmm. I would to, I was at Georgia and, and Chrissy was both at LSU as well as at Clemson. So definitely saw a lot more of it out there. Absolutely. Yeah, makes sense. Well, I was evaluating birch plant, birch trees in Arkansas in one year, well, two years that Japanese beetles just devoured my plot. <laughs> so nice. I have had a good experience with Japanese beetles. Well, you know, Who's another, another great indicator of grubs are predators, right? If you go out in your yard and you see that, you know, a, a skunk or a raccoon or armadillo has dug up a lot of your yard, then that might be a good sign that you do have something down there that they're, they're digging for. Or the alien predator. Hmm. If you're seeing yes. that as well, it can also. <laughs> <laughs> then there are human pests around. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, last but not least on my topics are just a few turf grass disease updates. And so um, bipolaris leaf spot is a, a pretty common disease when we start talking about Bermuda grass. We might also see it in some of our Bermuda grass pastures as well. It can also be a, a issue out there. So prime time for development is right now. And so, you know, any time between that 75 to 90 degree um, temperature range when it's kind of cooler at night, it's wet, cloud cover, you can't get out and mow as much, you know, moisture's hanging around, we can't open the canopy up, there's no air movement really in the canopy. I know it's kind of tough to see these photos here, they're kind of small, um, but initially we're going to start seeing those spots develop as really tiny, small, black, almost brown um, spots on the leaves and on the sheaths. And so eventually, if we, if we don't take care of it, if we um, can't mow out of it, we can't get rid of it, then we're gonna start seeing what's called melting out. And so basically all these spots are gonna coalesce together, the sheaths, the crown, any basal portion of the plant is gonna start rotting basically. And it can be pretty extensive, um, but you can take care of it. We, we do have multiple fungicides out there labeled for bipolaris leaf spot, especially if you know you've had it in the past. You know, you can spray some preventative control. Um, best to wait until the soil dries out a little bit, right? We can't um, expect the fungicides to have much efficacy when our, our soils are really wet. All right. Um, gray leaf spot is something that I've already seen developing throughout the state uh, in my backyard. Um, the same kind of deal, right? You know, St. Augustine is, and ryegrass are the primary grasses, but of course, St. Augustine's are the ones we're going to worry about during the summer. Can develop the same type of temperature, 70, 95, and a lot of leaf wetness is required. So, it's been raining a ton. Some places we can't move the water. Our leaves are staying wet. We might have a more shady spot that we just can't dry up. Um, so if we're getting at least nine hours of that leaf wetness, that's what's going to be required for the infection to start to initiate. And so, you know, um, same type of deal. We can mow almost out of this gray leaf spot can spread by airborne spores. And so if we do have it, we need to mow, collect the clippings, remove those clippings, get them out of there. Okay, I know I'm running short on time. I wanna have time for Kevin to talk. So last but not least, take all root rot. You know, we heard a few weeks ago, Dr. Young Key Joe talk about take all root rot. So we won't spend a lot of time on that, but it's probably coming if you're seeing it already out of that transition period, you know, um, doing those cultural practices that we talked about, you know, acidifying the soil as much as possible with compost, peat moss, any type of sulfur-based product. If you need help with that, please contact us. But this is a, a ever-growing problem, especially if you have higher soil pHs. These typically are found more often above about a 6.5, 6.6 pH in the soil. Um, and so it's pretty common in, in the most of our states um, when we're talking about, especially St. Augustine. St. Augustine is very susceptible, but we can have other, other ones as well. I think my last slide is just a bunch of different emails that I've gotten. Hey, take all root rot and centipede. Never thought I'd see that one. You know, centipedes typically a, a acid loving um, plant. And so, you know, if we get a higher, um, 
soil pH and centipede, a lot of time we start seeing decline anyway. But so take our root rot and centipede, bipolaris leaf spot in Bermuda, gray leaf spot in my backyard, my dog. <laughs> um, dollar spot is a common problem for a lot of professionals golf course wise, but this is actually a home lawn last year. And then of course, the large patch is kind of on its way out, right? And so remembering that we, we don't necessarily um, recommend a fungicide application for large patch in the spring, because once our temperatures start rising, then we should see the activity start declining. All right, Kevin, on to you. Got Hi, my name is Kevin. Um, <laughs> so, uh, one of the first things, uh, is to maybe look at, uh, you know, looking at pollinator friendly pesticides. Uh, so, you know, I'd ask you as, as you're going into the summer, as you're thinking about, um, monitoring for some of your pests and, and how you have to manage them, maybe take a look at your inventory again and see kind of what are the potential impacts on pollinators. And, uh, as well, maybe there's some new products available that have less impact on pollinators that you can look at you know, replacing them with down the line uh, as, as opportunity permits. So the EPA has required these new uh, bee boxes, right? Um, so you're going to see this on a lot of new pesticide labels, and it's specific to how this uh, product can impact bees. So this product can kill bees and other insect pollinators. And remember, the label is the law, right? So when it says how you can or cannot apply this, especially as it pertains to pollinators, uh, that's going to be very important to follow that. It used to be and still is also under the environmental hazards section. So you'll see there, this, pro this product is toxic to honeybees, yada, 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 but then also has its own exclusive section as well. Again, to stress the importance on um, protecting pollinators. And again, I mean, the reason why this happened was because there was a landscape application that did not follow the label law on how it can be applied to things on bloom. It resulted in, I mean, the news media said over 50,000 bees dead as a result of an application was a PR nightmare for that landscaping company and for that individual. So you do not want to be in that boat. So you want to make sure to check if your products are um, friendly towards pollinators and in general towards other beneficials. It can you very quickly can get on what's referred to as a pesticide treadmill. And, uh, you know, if we're too quick to jump onto our, our, our pesticides, we may be inadvertently causing a secondary out pest outbreak. So as an example, there are some pesticides, like one was mentioned earlier, carbaryl, that has a huge list of, uh, hey. hey buddy, I got my son just came in here. Hey buddy. Perfect timing. Right when I'm talking. <laughs> he speaks. <laughs> he speaks. So we've got a, a, as you can see, carbaryl has a huge uh, list of insects that can be impacted as a result Ew. of that pesticide. So there's a better chance that you're going to inadvertently impact uh, your beneficials, your predators as well. So if you can, again, look for something that's a little bit more selective, meaning it has less products on that list. <laughs> Sorry. And that was my wife, Lua. Thank you, Becky, for mentioning that's my wife, Lua. This is my son, Silas. Uh, let's see if I can find my dog as well. Introduce you to the whole family. Oh my goodness. Uh, Erfan, you're a human being. You're yeah, a I know. human being. I, I know we are people. Bot. I know we are people. Uh, and then the next thing is uh, monitoring and scouting. All right. So uh, as you start going into the season, looking for uh, insect pests and finding ways to monitor them, consider adding things to your tool set if you don't have them, which includes hand lenses. All right. Uh, can be very handy to have, especially to see some of those smaller insects like chinch bugs, even though you can see with the naked eye, it's a lot easier to confirm if you have a hand lens. Um, spider mites on leaves, a lot easier to see with the hand lens. I've, I've gone from hand lens to using a, a nice macro camera uh, uh, like add on to my phone. Gives me 10 times magnification and allows me to not only see that thing, but also take good pictures and video so I can send it to other people that can help me identify it. Uh, and this one in particular is by this company called Moment. I'm not endorsing uh, this specific company, but uh, it, I have found that it works highly effectively. It comes with a specific case for the lens to actually clip onto. So it has a very small form factor, very uh, mobile friendly, so very easy to use. 
Uh, also a head lens. So if you're actually monitoring on a regular basis, doesn't hurt to have one of these in your vehicle for under 20 bucks off Amazon. You can get this thing and uh, you can get some decent magnification while keeping both your hands free. And all of your colleagues and competitors will look at you as like being really cool and advanced. They'll be like, wow, look at those guys. They're pretty cool. Or your clients will say, these guys are the real deal. Look at them wearing head lenses. Uh, and then it also helps to have, I have a white piece of foam board in my uh, car uh, in a plastic sleeve. I mean, very handy for a lot of small insects, especially if they're in the flowers like thrips that uh, can be hard to just see by looking at the plant. But when you knock them out onto a white piece of paper, or in this case, a white foam board, they'll move and writhe around and a lot easier to see there. So a very inexpensive, uh, simple monitoring tool. Then always have some contraptions and containers and baggies on you because you never know when you have to collect something to get a better ID and know whether something is of, of concern or, or needs uh, anything to be done with it. Um, and a handy new guide that's come out just in this last year. Uh, this is actually from a colleague, an entomologist through UT Austin. And he teaches an incredible uh, insect photography course every single year, along with some other excellent insect photographers. And he just recently published this book, Common Insects of Texas and Surrounding States, a field guide. It's an excellent field guide with incredible photos. It's by no means uh, going to have every insect in Texas. That would be a very large textbook, but it's going to have some of the most common insects that you're going to encounter and help you with uh, saying identifying those particular insects. And it's not a heavy investment. So consider getting that to, to help you with recognizing uh, some of your insects. Yes, I want that. Yeah. Bet. What is Good. it? It's a book specifically on Texas bugs. And I've been looking for a bug like that. Very good, Mandy. Thank you for letting us know. <laughs> Thank you for chiming in. That's, uh, yeah, so get on that. <laughs> All right. Is there anything else? Do we want to uh, add anything else before we do the uh, the concluding remarks? We're we good. Kevin's, where did Kevin's pictures go? Was it good? That's, I was kind of, I'm looking at Kevin. I don't know if you can see me looking at him on my second so, monitor. Were you just able in case, to, I don't know. Get those. Are you able to re refresh? Yeah. No, because it's actually, I downloaded the PowerPoint. So I'll, I'll oh, uh, Kevin, I can share Kevin's. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't no, worry about it. You know, we, we, we're pretty much out of time. I, if, if Becky okay. does put up the show, you know, there, there were just essentially three things that were on there. Uh, Mung Mung has already touched on one of those, which uh, I had a picture of a queen palm uh, recovering, and that was taken down in the Rio Grande Valley. Just to, to let you guys know out there, with the, the with the winter type damage, palms is hit and miss around the uh, central Texas area with palm trees. Uh, most of the Washingtonia robusta, so your Mexican fan palms are dead. However, you got some that appears to be recovering. And what I've been told uh, by Dr. Mark Arnold is a lot of this uh, are probably hybrids with uh, the California fan palm. So the California fan palm seems to come through a lot better. Uh, so you, you do have to be a little patient. Now we are seeing those new spear leaves showing up again. Um, I would say give it another three months or so if there's no tops on it, or if you happen to get to the top and it's mushy, chop it down, that's done. Uh, second thing that I, was, I had a picture on was uh, some funky growth on uh, uh, roses amongst some dead branches. So we do have, if, if those rose bushes were exposed to coal, there was some coal damage. So you have branches that are dead. Um, if you haven't pruned that out, probably not the best time to do it right now as, as the other things are growing through and just wait for the flowers to be done, at least on those that were done uh, to be able to uh, prune that off. If uh, those are still visible, go ahead and chop them up, clean it up, make it look good. Uh, those roses are going to look great this year. Uh, this is actually uh, uh, some of the roses in the median in, in, in Bryan. And, and we are seeing a lot of good new growth, some of them a little bit with epinacy, a little bit funky, not rose rosette. Um, and, and, and for the most part, it will grow out of it. We do see a lot of red colorations, especially with the knockout series and the drift series. Again, at the clinic, we're getting a lot of folks worrying that it might be um, uh, rose rosette, it is not. Another symptom that we have been getting quite a few calls on 
uh, and, and, and if you're dealing with landscapes, be on the lookout for it. It, 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 it reminds more of an herbicide damage or a zinc uh, deficiency, deficiency type symptom uh, with tiny little uh, um, uh, uh, rosetting on, on the new growth. Uh, a lot of times it will grow out of it. Um, but uh, the one other thing that we have sort of noticed at the clinic on roses, which was uh, quite interesting was um, we are seeing a lot of thrips, not a lot of thrip damage, a lot of thrips on the uh, 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 row samples that come in. So I suspect that, you know, the uh, damage will come along shortly uh, with that. Uh, the last slide I have there, and, and this really for you guys that deal with customers, uh, uh, just to uh, point out, this was actually from my yard on St. Augustine. Hopefully you can see the blue spots. Slime molds are back again. Uh, I think for the most part uh, uh, in Texas, we've been really wet. Uh, not so much, I guess, far west Texas and, and, and far north Texas or the panhandle. Uh, but when you talk about central Texas, north Texas and south Texas, uh, we're getting a lot of, uh, um, I guess, questions like, what's this in my yard? And it, it's on different, not only on grasses, but also on shrubs, on plants and so on. And, and slime molds come in many different colors. Uh, it's a mix of mice, not something that you need to worry about. Will it kill the grass? It's a lot of, uh, or, or the plants. Um, that's the question that we get a lot. Well, it could um, uh, smother it, compete for light for it. And if you're really concerned about it in, in this case, just stick a hose and a jet of water and wash it off. Um, I say, enjoy it, it's nature. Um, now, the reason why I put this up and call it, you know, hot for summer, because when we get temperatures start getting high up and there is a lot of moisture in the ground, a lot of humidity, you tend to get uh, this quote unquote fruiting bodies of nexomycetes and fungi showing up. So around this time too, you may see a lot of mushrooms. If there are fairy rings in your lawn, you might see those mushrooms or quote unquote toadstools uh, uh, popping up. This can happen, uh, and it looks like it'll probably happen more through the summer if we stay wet or in urban areas if there is excessive irrigation. So if you create an environment that is mild nights, warm days or hot days, and, and, and moist, moist and wet, you are gonna have fungi and slime molds basically uh, um, uh, fruiting, and that's what it's gonna look like. Um, as a guy who likes, as a fun guy, I say, enjoy it. It's fun and it's pretty. Um, oh yeah, I forgot about that one. Um, just a little story about uh, this too. As the summer comes about, people start to get uh, the, uh, the uh, swimming pool uh, going and so on. Uh, you gotta be aware of the chemicals, whether it's a salt, salt water or chlorine tank or so on. and 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 when you hear salt and, and chlorine, those are not the only two things that might be actually in that pool. And, and if there's overflow of it, some of those chemicals can interact with some of the soil chemicals. What's happening here is this Chinese pistache is showing uh, um, um, symptoms of bo uh, boron toxicity. And uh, that was basically from an overflow from a pool, uh, 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 a salt water pool that basically there was some reaction in the soil chemistries when they did the uh, soil test, it came back, it was really high in boron. So that was one of those things that took about, um, I would say about six or seven weeks uh, to get to the answer. So this goes back to what Dr. Uh, Bowling had mentioned earlier. Uh, please, if there is concern, this is a great time uh, to go about, get a good soil test, to get an understanding of what's happening in your soil. So you can go ahead and plan not only for this summer, but also fall and the following year uh, to kind of get a baseline of, of, of the fertility uh, that needs to be put in place. As a plant pathologist, one thing I can point out to you guys, if you maintain a vigorous, uh, happy uh, environment for your shrubs, for your landscape plants, for your turf, uh, it is less likely uh, to get infected or be attacked by a pathogen. So keep that in mind. All right, folks, it's about 1.28. Last things, uh, do you have the uh, uh, QR codes for the uh, surveys? So, Erfan, tell us yeah. about that. 
Uh, so first and foremost, if you'd like to see any of these recordings, they are put up on the YouTubes. They are also on the Facebook. You can use either that QR code, or if you search the Texas Plant Clinic, you will find a playlist that's specific to the chat with Green Aggies. We could use Mandy's highly enthusiastic endorsement right now. If she wants to come out and just say that that's exactly what she's been looking for, that would be awesome. If not, we'll go on to the next thing is please provide your feedback. Uh, feedback is always very helpful. Uh, if you could either scan that QR code, I've also put the, um, the link in the chat and it's also right there, sixlaggedaggy.com forward slash chat survey. Knowing uh, how these webinars are doing and how they're impacting your business is highly critical for the continuation of these webinars. So please take a moment to fill that out uh, if you don't mind. And lastly, here is the schedule coming up. So we just did, is your landscape ready for summer checklist? Next, we have trees in the edible landscape and stone fruit uh, diseases on June 3rd. So that is our, uh, our trees or arboriculture focused um, week. So we hope to see you there. And that is all, unless we had anyone else had anything else to add? Again, about a bunch of shaking heads. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today and we hope to see you again next week. Take care.